Driving along Highway 375 in central Nevada, the desert landscape of basin and range stretches out in all directions as far as the eye can see. It is the archetypal American West, wide open spaces and harsh conditions where only the most rugged of individuals have settled and survived. There are no cities here. Towns, if you can call them that, are few and far between. And the only sounds that disturb this pristine wilderness are rattlesnakes, coyotes, and jet aircraft. Highway 375 is on the eastern flank of the Southwest Test and Training Range Complex. At its center is Nellis Air Force Base, 5,000 square miles of earth and sky that's known as the military's private playground. Here, the Air Force's version of Top Gun exercises take place. Nellis Air Force Base probably the high, holy place of the fighter pilot. For fighter pilots training at Nellis, the sky's the limit, with one unqualified exception. No one, no matter what their level of security clearance, is allowed to fly at any time or at any altitude in the airspace designated R-4808. You do not fly into that area, even if it means breaking off a combat uh, or diverting. Uh, it is simply not done. In Air Force parlance, airspace R-4808 is called Dreamland, so named by a pilot who was inspired by a poem of the same name by Edgar Allan Poe. Dreamland encloses 60 square miles of the most secure, most secret land in the United States. And inside lies the mysterious place known as Area 51. Just the idea of a secret base out in the middle of Nevada where the possibilities are endless because we don't know what's going on there for the most part uh, is powerful and potent and alluring. For nearly a half century, Area 51 has been the military's best kept secret. So secret, in fact, that until very recently, the U.S. government denied it even existed. Everybody knows that the place is there. Everybody knows it's working. But the government is the secret. However, for a place that is supposedly non-existent, Area 51 has an inordinate amount of security. Just a few miles down this road lies a bastion, uh, a sanctuary of some of the most classified and high technology programs that exist in the world. Along nameless dirt roads off Highway 375, signs warn the curious that it is illegal to enter, photograph, sketch, or even look at anything beyond this point. Motion sensors in the road and along the perimeter alert a private security force to approaching trespassers. As far as we know, nobody's ever been able to penetrate the base. And uh, somebody would be, we'd have to be extra stupid to try. Everything is highly monitored. It is impenetrable. And even if you got close, you still have a dry lake bed to cross to get to the base. It is situated in such a place that uh, makes security uh, quite easy to, to maintain. Exactly what is the government hiding at Area 51? What projects could possibly require such intense security? The answer remains one of America's biggest mysteries. The absence of information is the most intriguing and titillating thing possible in the information age. Speculation about the secret work being conducted there has become a cottage industry. Now you've got the conspiracy nuts out there who say that it's the headquarters for the New World Order. You've got the hopelessly gullible saucer nuts who say that there are underground bases and huge vats where, where, where our military and is cooperating with aliens to build these hybrids. You've got some of these folks who say this is where the milk carton kids are all taken away for horrible medical experiments. All sorts of people have all put their own veneer on Area 51. The government's continuous refusal to acknowledge the existence of a research facility at Groom Lake naturally intensifies public interest. If they had said, yeah, we've got a base out here, yeah, it's called Area 51, we've got some secret programs, we need the secrecy for pur purposes of national security, they wouldn't have half the level of interest from the public and all these crazies uh, that they have now. Uh, instead, they've uh, denied that the base existed, they deny that it has that name, they've denied what programs are out there, they wouldn't even say what agency controls the base, and that has all fed the myth machine. At Area 51, separating myth from reality is extremely difficult. What we do know comes from former employees, declassified government documents, and tenacious researchers. 
Central Nevada may not be fit for man nor beast, but it's just right for testing nuclear warheads. And on February 2nd, 1951, the Atomic Energy Commission detonates an atom bomb 30 miles southwest of Groom Lake, now the newly established 200 square mile area called the Nevada Test Site. When the Nevada test site was set up, it was divided into uh, areas. And there's no apparent logic to the deployment of the numbers uh, on the map with these different areas. But Area 51 was the number given uh, to the one at the upper northwest corner that uh, included the Groom Dry Lake. Between 1951 and 1954, Area 51 is just another uninhabited patch of desert on the grid of the Nevada test site. To understand how it comes to be the site of the world's most secret military base requires a side trip to Burbank, California. In the 1950s, the hangars and test facilities around the Burbank airport belonged to Lockheed, the nation's largest aircraft contractor. What the average American citizen doesn't know is that deep within Lockheed is a secret testing facility known as Skunk Works. It is under the direction of aviation pioneer Kelly Johnson. Kelly Johnson is probably the most brilliant aerodynamic engineer in the history of the United States. Johnson and his Skunk Works team have a reputation for not only building state-of-the-art aircraft, but for doing it quickly, cheaply, and quietly. This is why the government comes to Johnson first in the summer of 1954. The Cold War needs a hot secret weapon. The CIA came with this dramatic and immediate brief. We need an airplane that can fly over the Soviet Union, see what they're doing in the way of bombers and missiles and uh, nuclear weapons, because there were not yet spy satellites, of course. Kelly Johnson's answer is to design the U-2, a long-range jet aircraft that can fly at 70,000 feet above the reach of radar. Work begins in the winter of 1954 on the new plane. Eight months later, Johnson's U-2 is ready for a test flight. Up until that time, he had tested all the aircraft up at, at Edwards, and it was clear that if this thing was going to be as secret as it had to be to work, they were going to have to find somewhere even more hidden away to test it. Kelly Johnson, along with test pilot Tony Levere, heads east to search for a new site. Flying over Groom Mountain, the men spot a large dry lake bed reminiscent of their Edwards test site. The fact that it has been bathed in atomic bomb fallout for more than four years is only seen as a plus. The idea was that they needed somewhere far from prying eyes to test this spy plane. Where better but the Nevada nuclear test site where no one in their right mind would venture. When we continue, Cover stories and a pattern of denial become standard operating procedure at Area 51. Area 51, Groom Lake, Dreamland. The government's super secret testing facility in the Nevada desert will go by many names. The names this place had were almost like religious terms. Ben Rich, who was the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, told me that uh, he legally could not say the words Groom Lake or Area 51. On July 14, 1955, the first U-2 prototype is shipped from Burbank to Area 51. The U-2 spy plane was at first disguised as a weather plane. Three weeks later, it's ready to fly, and the government has its cover story in place. A phony press release is issued. As far as the government is concerned, Area 51 does not exist and neither do its employees. One uh, man who had worked out at uh, Room Lake described to me the whole secrecy experience as being like a lead overcoat. I mean, it, was, it was a constant weight, and it was the weight of not being able to tell your uh, family what you did. Two weeks after the first U-2 test flight, on August 19, 1955, President Dwight D. Eisenhower signs Executive Order 10633, restricting for the first time the airspace over Groom Lake. And to further protect the Skunk Works operations, a public land order is signed on June 20, 1958, making the 60 square miles around Groom Lake officially non-existent. 
It is not very effective, however, in keeping the U-2 a secret from the Soviet Union, who have spies at the Turkish military installation where the U-2 is based. The Russians very quickly became aware that the aircraft were up there, um, but it became a, a question of cat and, cat and mouse. The operation was deniable until the Russians could shoot down a U-2. And that's what eventually happened. On May 1st, 1960, pilot Francis Gary Powers' U-2 is shot down over the Soviet Union. President Eisenhower at first denied that it was a spy plane, but as the facts of the matter uh, emerged, uh, it was clear that this was something the American people had been kept in the dark about for years. And it was not only important in the history of the Cold War because it scuttled an important summit conference uh, that was about to begin, but it, it was one of the first episodes where the American people knew they had been lied to by their government. The government's response to revelations about the U-2 is not to come clean, but to make the testing facility at Groom Lake even more secure, even more secret. What it doesn't want anyone to find out is that Area 51 is already building its next top secret aircraft. The CIA launched a program for a replacement that would not only be very high flying, um, but would also be very fast, and to the extent that that was possible um, would be hard to detect on radar. On January 15, 1962, the Air Force requests that the restricted airspace over Groom Lake be quadrupled. Three months later, the top-secret A-12 makes its first test flight. This is one of the most astonishing technological feats in history. It's still a plane that looks like it comes out of the next century, even though uh, it first flew uh, in the early 60s. But like the U-2, the A-12 doesn't stay secret for very long. In the election year of 1964, President Lyndon Johnson reveals the existence of the Blackbird to the American public. He said the aircraft were being tested at Edwards, which of course, like, uh, there was no A-12 at Edwards and there never had been. When the press is invited to Edwards for the A-12's unveiling, the secret machine inside Area 51 has to do some fancy footwork. Two A-12s were very hastily flown to Edwards. Well, they came across at Mark Tree. When they landed, they were still hot from aerodynamic heating. Uh, but in order to keep them out of sight, they were ushered very quickly into a hangar, um, whereupon the sprinkler system went off and drenched all the um, guests waiting for the aeroplanes to arrive. While the nation gawks at the A-12, designers at Area 51 are already busy planning its successor, the SR-71 Blackbird. As the SRs came along, the base was greatly expanded, new hangars were built, um, new fuel tanks were installed. With newer, larger facilities come many significant changes in the history of Area 51. Any designation of Area 51, per se, or of a uh, test facility at Groom Dry Lake were left off all the government maps. It was also left out of the uh, government satellite uh, imagery databases that were on the Internet. So that means that someone who had the highest clearance in the government couldn't even look at Groom Lake. It was so secret. In 1967, the government policy of creating cover stories changes to one of absolute denial. 1967 is also the year the Air Force captures its first Soviet MiG-17 and ships it to Area 51. In the following years, more MiGs and other enemy aircraft will follow. Activities at Groom Lake now begin to descend out of historical fact and into speculation. In 1968, Area 51 is wrapped up in its ultimate security blanket. Everything on, in and over the base gets a special designation. Black Project. Some of these programs are what are called unacknowledged. And what that means is that the existence of the program and its purpose are secret. And that's what makes them black. They don't officially exist. Even the people working inside Area 51 are kept in the dark about exactly what their facility is doing. For instance, there would be simultaneous projects going on inside Area 51. When one plane produced by one project was rolled out for testing. The guys working on the uh, project in the hangar next door would all have to go inside. 
Funding for the black projects in Area 51 comes out of a secret pool of taxpayer dollars known as the black budget. It's uncontrolled money. Uh, at this point, we figure it's about $30 billion a year. It's a lot easier for people to get away with uh, a lot larger uh, spending, more wasteful spending, perhaps, uh, without the same sort of scrutiny that, that uh, goes on around the rest of the government. And no matter what the cost, it is believed that only a third of the money in the black budget goes into the actual projects themselves. The rest is spent on keeping the secrets secret. There's no easy rule of thumb on how much keeping a program in the black, as they say, adds to it, but it is uh, a factor of several times. There's the tremendous cost of security background checks. There are the geographical transport costs of getting things uh, out into the middle of nowhere. And then there are the costs of patrolling not only the physical edges of these facilities, but patrolling the lives of those who work there. Because of its black designation, after 1968, we know nothing for certain about what is being developed at Groom Lake. We know there are programs out there. It's a question of assigning an identity to them. And that's where the, the sheer side of the black budget makes it difficult. There's all sorts of things that could have been done out there. When we continue, a former government employee reveals the contents of alleged Area 51 briefing papers. Basically, I looked at the pictures and it just saved. <laughs> and there were pictures of what? The dead aliens. In the 1970s and 1980s, the secret test facility at Groom Lake operates in total obscurity. Its activities known only to the people inside Area 51, and they are sworn to secrecy. The test pilots were doing something that was at the top of their profession. They were setting new speed altitude records almost daily, and yet they couldn't tell anyone. They couldn't tell their wives. They couldn't uh, tell the uh, Guinness Book of World Records. Even now, we know very little about the black projects developing there, and the few facts we do know come out in strange ways. For instance, there was an airplane called Tacit Blue, which flew around the same time as the early stealth prototypes. The military denied the existence of this craft for years and years. Then all of a sudden, they announced it was going to be brought to the Air Force Museum. In hindsight, we also know that in the late 1970s and early 1980s, Area 51 tests and perfects the technology known as stealth. The Air Force, and quite rightly, didn't even want to give anybody a clue of how far they were going in terms of stealth, because that would have allowed people to um, make some preparations to detect these aircraft. The few aware of Area 51 fall into two groups. Aviation buffs, who speculate about the outer limits of aircraft technology, and a handful of UFO enthusiasts, who believe that Area 51 is the successor to Hangar 18, the infamous location where the supposed debris from the Roswell saucer crash of July 1947 is being stored. Stories started bubbling up about UFOs in Area 51 back in the 70s and really started going in the mid-80s with a man named John Lear who started putting out some very uh, very outlandish tales. And, and he's a guy who's really credible in a lot of ways. Air Force pilot, uh, son of the Learjet developer, uh, sharp guy. So that, that made people kind of uh, prick up their ears. But Lear's tales of flying saucers at Groom Lake remain on the fringes of Area 51 lore. Then, in May 1989, a television station in Las Vegas broadcasts a series of interviews that changes the imaginary landscape of Area 51 forever. Well, for better or for worse, I think a lot of the blame or credit goes to myself and, and KLAS-TV, because although there had been stories here and there about Area 51 before we did our series, after that, it went everywhere, and it became a, a, a household name all over the world. You get off the bus, what do you see? It's a very interesting building. It's got a slope of probably about 30 degrees. The, uh, the man being interviewed is Bob Lazar, and what he is describing is a secret testing facility near Area 51 called S-4. Lazar knows this place, he claims, because he worked there. Little reports in, in blue covers that were stacked up on a table. I sat down in a room and I just uh, glanced through all of them and 
I, th they said they only gave me 20 some odd minutes just to thumb through these things. I think they just stuck me in the room to keep me busy for a minute, but uh, there were some really shocking things in the reports. There were reports of uh, uh, showed alien cadavers, uh, like I spoke about before, antimatter reactors, technology that doesn't exist. Uh, Let's take them one at a time. Al a report on alien cadavers. They were autopsy reports. I mean, I didn't look completely read them uh, because I didn't have time and as soon as I got into some interesting things I wanted to get through these really quickly because I know I didn't have much time. Uh, basically I looked at the pictures in them to save time. <laughs> and there were pictures of what? The dead aliens. Lazar not only has an incredible story to tell, he also appears to have the credentials to back up his claims. Lazar also has proof that he once worked at another top secret testing facility in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, we took him to a couple of polygraph examiners. The first one was inconclusive. The second one said there was no question that he was telling the truth. How did he pass that? He knows about the inner workings of the base because there was a guy I know who worked out there who uh, put him through his paces, asked him a bunch of questions, not where do they store the flying saucers, but things like, where's the cafeteria? How do you pay for your meals? What color is it inside? That sort of thing. And he passed. How did he know? It's enough to convince a lot of people that Lazar is telling the truth. And the more he is interviewed, the more he tells. Believe it or not, that was not the most shocking thing to me. I said, great, okay, now and, you know, next, and uh, began to dig what was, through. What was next? Well, the technology part, the, uh, the drive on the flying saucers, the flying disks, how they operated, the power source for them, I really dived into that most deeply and spent most of my time on that. What did it say? The power source is an antimatter reactor. Uh, they run gravity amplifiers. But perhaps the most compelling part of Bob Lazar's remarkable story is that he says he knows exactly when and where these extraterrestrial craft can be seen. For one month in 1989, Lazar leads expeditions out to a black mailbox just off Highway 375 near the tiny town of Rachel, Nevada. As if on cue, strange disks begin hovering in the distance inside Dreamland. We've got videotape of things that look very much like flying saucers. We've got the witnesses who say they've seen them. If this is a secret government program and it's been developed since the 50s, where the hell is it? The Lazar sightings put Area 51 and the town of Rachel on the map. It is the right story at the right time. As a country, we didn't believe what our government told us. There was a poll that said more people believed in UFOs and believed they would get their money out of the social security system, which I thought was indicative. A struggling bar and grill in Rachel is renamed the Little Ailey Inn and becomes the de facto gathering place for newborn UFO enthusiasts from around the world. Lazar could have been ordered up by the Nevada tourist board. He brought so many people into the area. In fact, the, the governor of the state of Nevada drove up to Rachel Nevada on Highway 375 and in tandem with the producers of the film Independence Day, uh, officially dedicated that highway as the extraterrestrial highway. The black mailbox becomes so much of an attraction that the owner of the box, rancher Steve Medlin, has to paint it white and padlock it to keep people from stealing his mail. It's not like uh, Stonehenge or anything like that, but some people revere this thing to the point that uh, to come here and to be with the mailbox and to sign the mailbox basically completes the whole uh, reason for their trips. But even in the midst of the UFO boom, not all the UFO believers are convinced that Bob Lazar is telling the truth. He had... Uh, enough information that he made many people believe he might be a disinformation agent, a plant to throw attention away from the real secret projects that were going on. If it was a setup of some sort to divert attention away from something else going on out there, as many people have claimed, it was a miserable failure. Because the result has been that tens of thousands of people from all over the world have trekked out there to see whatever it is that's flying around in the sky. When we continue, intense public interest marks the beginning of the end for many of the secrets within Area 51. It is going to be a lot more difficult for security managers 
to keep what's going on at Groom Lake a secret. In the early 1990s, with the Area 51 boom in full swing, the piece of public land with the best view of the secret facility is a place called Freedom Ridge, 12 miles east of the Groom Lake complex. From Freedom Ridge, patient sky watchers camping out for days on end are treated to a tantalizing show of strange shapes and lights in the sky. I've seen a double delta aircraft that is unidentifiable. I've seen a large diamond shaped aircraft. I've seen a small Batmobile shaped thing. It looks like a baby B2. I've seen some drones. I don't believe it is just airplanes. There's too many people that have seen and heard things. I think alien beings have been with us forever. And I think they're working side by side with our government on this test site. It was interesting how tech lore and folklore graded into one another and how there seemed in even the nerdiest techno geek to be a desire for some kind of exciting, almost spiritual experience out there. Eventually, Bob Lazar tires of what he perceives to be near hysteria surrounding Area 51 and stops talking about the subject altogether. In reaction to the outlandish theories of UFO believers, aviation and technology buffs, including Mark Farmer and Bill Sweetman, form an organization called the Interceptors. The Interceptors exchanged information, had campouts, and uh, uh, tried to goad the uh, Air Force a little bit. I refer to them uh, at times as the Decentral Intelligence Agency. If we have an icon as interceptors, it's the lawn chair. And it's men in lawn chairs uh, out here in the desert sitting for days uh, for really no good reason that has caused the government to basically change the rules of engagement out here. They were able to find an amazing amount of information, looking at budget documents, going to places and taking pictures. All these small bits and pieces of information by themselves are not classified. But the mosaic we've been able to produce as interceptors is highly classified. And uh, the government doesn't like that, and I don't blame them a bit. On October 18th, 1993, the Air Force demonstrates its disapproval by closing off an additional 3,972 acres around Groom Lake from public use. The new secured area includes Freedom Ridge. Although closing off Freedom Ridge makes it easier to keep prying eyes away from Area 51, it ultimately fans the flames of suspicion. I think it's no coincidence that it did happen in uh, a period when people were suspicious of government, when, when the Cold War had just ended, um, and yet there was continuing secrecy. Uh, what could the Air Force be being so secret about? The cause for truth at Area 51 is given a tremendous boost in 1996 when the respected Federation of American Scientists initiates a program called Public Eye. But for the most part, the American public never gets an appreciation of what they're paying for or uh, what they're doing. And uh, what we're trying to do is sort of keep the, policy, the government policy community and the intelligence community honest. And one of the ways the Federation achieves its goal is by hiring a private satellite, Space Imaging's Iconos satellite, to snap their own pictures of Area 51. Our intention for ordering the image of Area 51 was really to see whether we would get the image in the first place and uh, to shed more light on what the government's doing there. We can point cameras at even the most sensitive U.S. government facilities uh, with impunity, uh, which means that we can point our cameras anywhere else in the world. The images don't display alien bodies or flying saucers as some hope, but they do provide the public with the most detailed images ever taken of Area 51. Now, with the proliferation of more high-resolution satellites, it, it is going to be a lot more difficult for security managers to keep what's going on at Groom Lake a secret. As the aviation experts see it, what the government is hiding continues to be what they've always hidden there, the government's most cutting-edge aircraft technology. I think you'd see, for example, tailless aircraft. I'm sure there's some work going on in terms of um, visual stealth. Probably the greatest piece of uh, gee whiz work that's going on out there is that we built a space plane 
it's suborbital and takes off under its own power. And uh, you could figure that once you have a target, uh, once you've figured out where you need to go, this thing could respond and be to where it needs to be within an hour, anywhere on the planet. Back at the Little Alien in Rachel, there are still those who cling firmly to the belief that government waste and space planes are only the tip of the Area 51 iceberg. I've had, from several different sources, have said that anything that is above ground in this facility over here, there's ten times or more than that underground. I've actually been told that there are six different beings on our test site. The large and the small nose gray, the humanoid, the orange, the blue, and the reptile. In some ways, the government invited the alien obsession at Area 51. It was a helpful distraction. The irony at Area 51 is that the greatest danger at that facility didn't come from aliens, and it didn't come from foreign powers. The greatest danger to those workers came from the United States government. To understand the real danger that Area 51 is hiding requires a step back in time, back to, strangely enough, 1989. While Bob Lazar is capturing national headlines with extraterrestrial tales about Area 51, a man named Robert Frost is suffering from a mysterious illness. His skin was starting to peel off his entire face, and he developed blisters and sores all over his body. The skin kept peeling off to a point where it was every day, and he'd have to wash it off with a washcloth about every hour or so. It was, I mean, it was just scaly like a fish. He said his face was on fire and his eyes were burning, and he just ran right through the house. He ran to the bathroom and he started throwing cold water all over his head, and he, he said he couldn't stand the pain. In 1989, Robert Frost is a sheet metal worker at Area 51. He is just one of the hundreds of nameless, faceless people who commute daily from their homes to the job site via unmarked 737s that take off from a secure hangar at Las Vegas' McCarran International Airport. On board the half-hour flight are the people who keep the secrets at Area 51, and a lot of them are getting just as sick as Robert Frost. Many of these guys developed a fish-like scale that could cover much of their body and would crack and bleed. Robert Frost had this condition more severely than most, and his guys tried to help him as much as they could. And when Robert died, it put a real chill through the base. When the workers go to their doctors, they are told they have a form of toxic poisoning that can only be treated if the specific poisons are known. Supervisors at Area 51 refuse to disclose what those poisons are or to release information from Robert Frost's autopsy report. It's a hell of a thing to lose a friend and have the government say there's not a bloody thing you can do about it because this place doesn't exist and frankly you don't exist. Well, they did exist. They're American citizens. And so they sued, and they proved that they existed. When we continue, what lawyers found when they went searching for the secret dangers hidden at Area 51. Private citizens have gone to jail for violations that are a fraction of what occurred at Area 51. In 1992, lawyer Jonathan Turley is contacted by several Area 51 employees who are suffering from a debilitating illness. I was the first lawyer that most of them had talked to. These are not the type of people who look to lawyers in the courts to resolve their problems. These are very patriotic people. They were put at Area 51 for a reason. And things had to get very, very bad for them to seek help. They decided that what was happening at Area 51 was a greater danger to the American people than what they were trying to defend against. That's a pretty awful point to reach. The workers aren't seeking money or punitive damages from the government. They just want to know why Robert Frost is dead and if they're going to die too. They didn't come to the government with these medical problems saying we want big uh, cash settlements. They just wanted to know what they'd been exposed to. These workers were coming down with classic symptoms of exposure to hazardous waste. What made it an almost impossible case was where they were exposed. Fearing severe reprisals from the government that has sworn them to secrecy, Area 51 workers are listed on court documents as John Doe's 1 through 6. 
Turley's meetings with the John Doe's are held in secret locations. And so you would sit in a garage with a man who was dying, who had to get out of his bed so that he wouldn't cause difficulty for his family if the government saw him or found out he was one of the John Doe's. And you sit there and you think, what's wrong with this picture? And this man was hiding from his government because he had the audacity to bring forth violations, including criminal violations, committed in his presence. What Jonathan Turley learns from the John Doe's is that not only is Area 51 the nation's most secret base, it's also America's most secret toxic waste dumping ground. Area 51 faced a problem. They couldn't ship out hazardous waste from a place that didn't exist. So they started to burn the waste. And the trenches and pits started getting bigger and bigger. Soon they were digging football field sized trenches, filling them with 55 gallon drums of waste, dousing them with air fuel, and then setting them alight with a flare. But there's a reason why burning hazardous waste is a crime. And the reason is that most hazardous waste is more dangerous when you burn it because there's an easier way to enter the human body. Now, in the genius of the military, they dug these trenches on the wind-receiving side of the base. So the wind would blow acutely hazardous waste throughout the base. That's why the workers called it London Fog. And when they complained, they were told that it's basically our way or the highway. They were told that Area 51 was a place that was so secret that federal law didn't apply there. And it shouldn't be much of a surprise that when you have a place where most anything can occur, most anything does. Secrecy is something that we need in government, clearly. Uh, but it is a very dangerous thing as well. It's very easy to use secrecy, not just to hide from the enemy, but to hide from friends, Congress, citizens, whatever. And the burning of toxic waste uh, was a perfect metaphor for the abuses of secrecy that happen inside Area 51. It takes three years for the workers at Area 51 to get their first day in court in 1995. There was something almost Fellini-esque about the case. I mean, we would stand in court and the government would deny the existence of a base that you could see from public lands. I could drive the judge to the base and point at the bloody thing. But here we were debating with the United States government whether it would exist or not. And while Turley debates the existence of a non-existent base, one of his John Doe's dies. It's Wally Kaza, the man who replaced Robert Frost as foreman. At points there were statements made by the government that left you laughing. And they would be enormously funny if you didn't have two dead clients. Eventually, Turley does get the government to admit that there is a secret testing facility at Groom Lake. But to this day, they deny that it is called Area 51. And the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals rules that the workers or their widows are not entitled to learn what hazardous substances exist at the secret facility. The ruling is based, in part, on Presidential Determination Number 95-45, in which President Clinton exempts the Air Force operating location near Groom Lake, Nevada, from all federal environmental laws. For several years, the President has signed a letter saying that it was, quote, of the paramount national interest that Area 51 remain secret and that it remain uh, outside the reach of discovery of court suits on behalf of workers. The government claimed that simply acknowledging that it is hazardous waste would put American lives at risk. Well, obviously, that's facially absurd. And it wasn't done for national security. It was done for the oldest reason in, in law. It was to hide misconduct and crimes, crimes that may have killed two people. Although the John Doe suit does not allow workers at Area 51 to know what they've been exposed to, it does mandate that future workers will not suffer the same fate. We forced the first inspection of a black facility, the first commitment to future compliance of a black facility. We forced them to acknowledge the existence of the base. We did a lot of things for the first time in Area 51. But you know, it really didn't feel like a point of celebration because there were people that were not around to see it. And despite everyone's best efforts, in the end, the whole truth about Area 51 is still a mystery. Tremendous things have happened out there. 
that uh, will probably never be told. And in some respects, it makes me sad. Someday, what happened at Area 51 will be made public. I truly believe that. And the public will be shocked about what was done in their name. When I began to gather myself together, I had met by this time other people who had had similar experiences. I began to ask myself, what did they want from me? I speculated about whether or not what seemed like a psychic attack could have been warnings. I have remembered more and more, not only the vision of the apocalypse, but other warnings and and consistent warnings, not only to me, but across the whole community of people who have had this experience, a lot of them get the same warnings, that we're in trouble, that our environment is in trouble. So I'm not alone in that. And I, that has become a really a central feature of my current life. In March of 1986, I had what was a seminal moment of change for me in this experience. After it became clear to them that I was trying to engage with them, they began to respond in various ways. It was the most extraordinary experience I've ever had. I remember seeing a bright blue light come under the door. I said, okay, let's do it. I just want to get to the bottom of this. I had no idea what I was in for. In, in March of 1986, I had what was a seminal moment of change for me in this experience. The sensation I felt when I tried to move on that night was like I was being impeded by something that really slowed you down, like a thick tar or something. When they are there, you have a feeling that is almost impossible to describe. I was terrified, but I sort of forced a grin onto my face and tried to smile. I couldn't smile very well. I wanted to try to show them that I was not dangerous that I was something that that I wanted to know more and there was a change then after it became clear to them that I was trying to engage with them they began to respond in various ways you were trying to build a bridge I think I think that was the first moment when, when, when there was any kind of real exchange I wouldn't say that, oh, this is definitely aliens. I would say that it was real and that we don't know what it was. That, that I am quite certain of. The public reaction to my book, Communion, was very complex. Literally, as soon as the book was published, letters that week, literally the week of publication, letters started coming. You got more letters. We had well over 200,000 letters over the years. We probably had closer to 500,000 over the years. I don't know what to say to them anymore. I don't have all the answers. Maybe just understanding the questions is enough.
After I began to read them, I realized there's something happening on planet Earth that we do not acknowledge. We don't know what it is. Is it aliens? Is it something to do with us and something about the way we are that we don't yet understand? I don't know, but it's real. In the late summer of 1994, it became clear that we were running out of money. We began to not be able to pay our mortgage, and it became clear we had to leave. And so, at the same time, though, that this was happening, I was having the one of the peak experiences of the whole thing. I'd begun meditating in the cabin because people had found the place, and there were other people out in the woods at night looking for the aliens with, with flashing flashlights up in the air and such childish stuff. And uh, I, so I meditated, and I stayed in the house and meditated from then on. I didn't really want to be disturbed by that. And one night, there were these thuds on the roof right above me. And the next moment, I could feel a presence in the room. At this point, these years later, I was easy with their presence in the house. I wasn't scared of that. And I finally said, I want to see you as you really are. And I didn't see any. And so I said, well, this is it. I'm leaving this room now, and I'm leaving it forever. I will never return to it, because tomorrow we leave, and we're leaving forever. And I left the room. I went to bed. I lay in the bed, still hoping something would happen. Suddenly, I saw a light light up in the front yard. It was a bright, beautiful white light shining on the grass like moonlight, but 10 times brighter. I got up and looked out the window, and this light with rays coming out of it, and the rays penetrated my body, some of them, and I could, like, taste his presence in the rays. It was the most extraordinarily beautiful experience I've ever had. The next morning, we left the cabin, and the experiences have never been like that since. People who don't have open minds and are dismissive of all of this, miss out on one of the most wonderful, frightening, dangerous, beautiful things that you can know. I did not ask for this. I did not know about it. I did not expect it. I did not want it, that's for sure. But it burst into my life without warning, and it's never left me since. Take from this what you will. This does happen to me. It has been happening to me all my life. And you don't have to believe because I know the truth. My earliest memories of being abducted by aliens were when I was very young, five, six years old. I was living in, in Ohio and it was kind of in the middle of nowhere. Our nearest neighbor was a mile or two away. There was, you know, nothing for miles. I would be in my bed, usually. I would hear voices coming down the hallway. The voices were of my parents, so I got comfortable thinking it was my parents. I remember seeing a bright blue light come under the door and shadows, actually, of something standing outside the door. And I realized that it was not my parents coming in. When they got close, I'd see those black almond-shaped eyes just staring right at me. Emotionless eyes just looking at me. 
and they would extend their hand and I would grab it as if I was really comfortable with them and had done this many times before. And uh, they often would let me take my favorite stuffed animal with me. As a child, I didn't realize that these beings didn't visit everybody at night. I thought when people went to bed, the bald men would come for everybody. And it was just a normal thing. I decided I would, you know, draw them and write down things that I could remember. I was always into art, so I really started to try to draw them as best as I could. Hey, sweetie. Hi, Mom. What are you doing? The bald men. What bald men? They're my friends. They come visit me at night. It didn't start to get uncomfortable until I started talking about the bald men to other people, whether it be classmates or family members, and they just said that it's not real, there's no such thing, you're just dreaming. It was very frustrating being told that this wasn't happening when I knew it was. Okay, Audrey, I need you to relax. As an adult, I would remember bits and pieces. I remember them coming in. I remember them doing something to me so I couldn't move. I remember them bringing me somewhere else and being other places. But the things I didn't remember were, you know, what were they doing to me when they took me? And I said, OK, I need to find people that could maybe help me. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Regression was a great tool to bring back the missing pieces, the memories. We're going to focus on a room. Didn't even think about it, didn't get educated on it, said, OK, I'm going to get hypnotized, let's do it. I just want to get to the bottom of this. It's a basement. You're going to walk down the stairs. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, this isn't going to work. You know, those memories are gone. I'm never going to remember what's happening. I didn't know anything about it. I had no idea what I was in for. Three, two, one. Audrey, tell me what you see. Tell me what you see. What you see. My first hypnosis session was the most traumatic experience that I think I've ever had in my life. I wasn't ready, I think, to, to see what they were doing. I wasn't ready to accept it. The bald men were just terrifying to look at. The people that wanted to help me, you know, they did this wonderful hypnosis session. They got all this, you know, detailed accounts of what's going on, and this was great stuff. But I never came back for a long time. I just left. I didn't want to think about it. They gave me a copy of the tape. I never listened to it to this day. Um, I try to forget. And I just ran from it for a long time. I started to live in denial that it was even happening until they came for me. I was just getting ready to go to bed. My window was open, and all of a sudden, I started hearing the shade flapping. And so I was sitting there, and I had the feeling that they were coming. The, it, I call it the heebie-jeebies. I get it. And it, it's like a pure state of panic, anxiety, but at the same time, almost like I feel like I'm magnetically attracting something to me. I just I can't explain it, but it is some kind of attraction. It got under the covers like I had as a child for so many years thinking that that would help. And I don't know, something kind of snapped inside me, and I said, you know, I'm, I want to see what's coming and what has been coming for me for so long. So I didn't hide under my covers this time. And as I sat there waiting, after the wind came the lights and um, the humming sound.
up, I woke up at a time I wasn't supposed to wake up. As I grabbed him, I heard, watch out for the mother. Once the light came into my window, I knew that it wouldn't be long. I started to feel uh, a twitching in my body and, and my arms moving by themselves like muscle spasms almost. And then buzzing sound, it's real steady. It was a, a kind of fear I can't even explain. Total confusion, anger, what are they doing? And then of course, why, why? I tried to scream so somebody could hear me and, and maybe help me, and I couldn't. There was no sound that would come out. For some reason, I started to like say, I'm gonna fight this. I'm not letting them take me. As I grabbed him, I heard in my head, watch out for the mother. And then I let go. I felt something me and it was a burning sensation instantly to a point where if I moved any muscle, it was like my whole body was on fire. It's weird because they kind of position you the way they want, almost like they can do it with their mind. Once you can't move, they can move you. So as I was levitated off the bed and I could feel myself moving straight ahead and I knew straight ahead my dresser was there with a mirror and it's backed up against the wall. I realized that I was going right through it and I could see my feet go right through the mirror. I uh, realized that I'm outside and it was really, really bright. I looked up and, and I saw the ship lights and I, they started to lift me towards this just enormous craft above my house. It was terrifying, confusing, you know, surreal. Like, this can't be happening to me. And uh, I went close to the ship. And that was the last thing I remember. And then I just blacked out. All of a sudden, I, I was awake and aware. I uh, noticed a man walking around me. And I looked at him, and he looked at me. He felt familiar to me for some reason. He touched me and was no longer a man. At this point, I asked it. And when I say asked, the, it's completely telepathic. And you, somehow know who it's coming from and even if there's a group of them. Finally, I asked, you know, after all these years, why are you doing this to me? And he said that they were working on altering my DNA. When he was talking to me, he actually cared. And that was a feeling that was really confusing because of course, you know, if you care, why do you abuse me? If you care, why are you doing this? But then I got to ask him and he said what he was doing. This was like a breakthrough. I got to talk to him and, and you know, it's been years. It's almost like that first question that I got to ask was just the beginning. There was a, a machine. It was strange looking, but I knew it was some kind of a clock. And it was counting backwards. I heard the words war and then just blacked out completely. And that's all I remember until, uh, you know, I woke up at some point. I don't know how long it was but I regain consciousness, I'm still on the table. And they're doing something to me. They had a machine that actually physically came and removed my eye. And when they 
pulled the eye out, I noticed that there was something coming to where my eye had been into the socket. This big, long needle, they put it into the eye socket, did something. The next thing I recall after seeing my eye getting removed was just being back in my room. The whole time I'm coming out of whatever they do to me, I would remember bits and pieces. I scrambled to my journal and I wrote down what I remembered. I don't usually even look at my journal because it does tend to bring back a lot of the fear and the emotions. And, you know, sometimes it's meant to be forgotten for good reason. Years later, I started to have physical problems from it and actually had to, you know, undergo various surgeries because of unexplained scarring in my, um, tubes and ovaries and, and uterus. There was just, you know, it's, the doctors didn't know what it was from. There was just scarring in there. I never told the doctors uh, what I knew it was from. It's not something that you can say, all right, hey doc, you know, this is what's going on, especially back then. I had this time in my life where it just kept happening and happening and happening and it really picked up for a couple years. This encounter uh, started as it always does. When I woke up there was there was a, one of the greys standing at the foot of my bed and I saw him there and then just blacked out completely. As I wake up this time after I blacked out, I was in a strange, strange place. I, I realized that I was in a, a cocoon surrounded in gel. I started to panic. One of the greys realized I was awake, hurried over to me. And, I remember seeing a needle coming at me, and it was a fear I can't even explain. I realized that I was in a, a cocoon surrounded in gel. I looked through the gel in the cocoon, I'm looking out and, into the room and I noticed that there's there's some greys in there and I couldn't tell exactly what they were doing, but I was distracted by a, a small girl. Um, looked like a small child, but it was what appeared to be a hybrid of a human and a grey alien. She was really strange. She wasn't dressed in, in the same clothes that Grays wear. She was dressed like it was um, old-fashioned clothes, maybe 1800s. It was confusing. It was almost, you know, surreal. As I was looking at her, she looked at me, and I felt almost like a kind of connection with this child, and she uh, came right up to me. It was a not just an interest, it was a, a connection like a deep connection, and, and it felt a uh, familiarity with her. One of the greys realized I was awake, hurried over to me, and I remember seeing a needle coming at me and, and right through the cocoon. And uh, then I just blacked out. And she's just always had a, a place in my heart, I guess, for, you know, from the experiences, I always remember that, that child. I 
it's it's like they're preparing us for something that's going to happen in the future um, to mankind. It's a it's a preparation of sort. Um, there's areas of the brain that we all know we don't use. Um, they could be storing the information there. They said that uh, you know when the time comes, we will act and know exactly what to do. Um, whatever's going to happen, I think that as abductees, we're being prepared to assist others with whatever changes is coming to this planet. I try sometimes to say, okay, this is all in my head, and, and I continue, and then something will happen that reminds me that it's very real. I've had times where I just step back and say, okay, I'm gonna just, you know, join the human race and just do normal things, and this is not happening to me, but they won't let me. Can't say that I, I would have chosen this if, if I had, you know, had a choice, but uh, for whatever reason, I'm, I'm going through this and it's not my imagination. I've, I've had a lot of time to, to think about what they did and, and how angry I was, but if they were really going to do it to hurt me, then why would they take the memories away? Why would they care, you know? Why would they care? They would just let me remember. I think that literally everybody is afraid of this. I think it happens to far more people than remember it at all. I see it as a part of the human experience that we cannot acknowledge. Most skeptics and people that don't believe are probably the ones that believe the most. People are eager to reject the things I've written about. And they are so scared of it that they have to put it out there that it's not happening. But when they look up in, you know, in space at night, I think they really know that there's not a chance that we're the only species here on, in this universe. And it's an unknown that every single one of us senses is there. And I know that the you know, population of people are being able to start talking about it. It's, it's like there's a worldwide awakening happening right now. That there is something happening on this earth to human beings that is powerful and real and that we either don't or can't acknowledge, even to this day. If you don't believe now, then just wait a little while, because the proof is coming.